We drink deeply our reward at the table of God's presence. All the saints are richly fed with the oil of God's anointing into service we are led. Come then, children, with your burdens, life's confusions, fears, and pain. Leave them at the cross of Jesus. Take instead his kingdom's reign. Bring your thirst, for he will quench them. He Good morning, everybody. Welcome this morning's worship service. Um, if you're here for the first time, thanks for coming. We hope to see you again. Um, and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Um, hope you're all enjoying the nice weather. And something uh, seems like a little rejuvenating about this first string of real nice weather we've had. I know for me, uh, uh, I've been getting outside and doing things since the first time this year. I had all my windows open in my house to get in some fresh air. So, why don't you join me as we get a breath of fresh air with the Lord's Prayer. Our, heaven, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we also forgive and our sins. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the power and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you stand? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. All the day long, perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side, angels descending. 
dwelling in the word for those of you that are new to us today this is a time when we just spend time in the word of God listening for his voice to us so what this looks like is um, we will start with an opening prayer then we will read the text which is on one side of this yellow document that should be in front of you um, We'll spend some time in silence, thinking about the scripture. And then, uh, when I prompt you, we'll take time sharing with each other. So get in small groups of two or three, talk about what you heard, but listen carefully to the people around you, because that's often where you hear God's word in a way that can reach you. And then, uh, when we've had time to do that, we'll come together and share what you heard the people you are talking with say and what the word is saying to you. So please join me in the prayer that is on the screen and at the bottom of the paper. Oh, Holy One, we hear and say so many words. 
yet yours is the word we need. Speak now and help us to listen. Amen. <coughs> Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. <clears throat> he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's find someone that you can share with this morning.
it sounds like these conversations could go on for hours. I'm sorry to stop you. Um, so, who would like to share what they heard this morning from a friend or the word? My friend Alan remarked on verse 20 where it says, and through him, through Christ, to reconcile everything to himself. And Alan remarked that uh, it was all God. It wasn't us doing any reconciling that, that God has done. Amen. Well, right above 17. All things have, have been created through him and for him. And, um, and it, it's just such a it just makes you just the world is just so beautiful. And she really loves uh, water and the sound of water and it really soothes her. talking in our group about uh, all things are made through and for him and that the invisible and visible, um, there are things that we haven't even discovered yet on this earth and in heaven that Christ has created. It's so funny how this church body will do this a lot. We were also in verse 16, um, and Zane pointed out that it says all things, not just comfortable, pleasant things. There is nothing that has been created and nothing that we go through where we are apart from God, and he can't follow us. That's wonderful. And that phrase reminds me of all things are work together for good for those who are called according to Spirit. Anybody else? Thank you so much for participating this morning. Would you stand with me? Hey. 
good to be together and worship together today. As Dave already mentioned in our welcome, happy Mother's Day to the mothers among us. I know some of you are here this morning with your mothers, and so um, may mothers be celebrated and honored today. Uh, and uh, also realize that days that deal with family can be complicated as well. Uh, that not everyone has family to, to love and celebrate, and there might be wounds and pain associated with that. And so today, uh, we, we hold space for that as well uh, as we enter in together. Um, it's good to be with you all today. Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is where we'll be reading from today. Uh, and uh, as you're turning there, you know, we missed being with you all last week, and I have to say a hearty thank you to those of you who shared your reflections on the dwelling passage during last week's worship. I did get to listen to the recordings, and um, there's just some really thoughtful people, uh, and so thank you. Uh, for what you shared and what you brought to this community. Uh, after a very full time at Pepperdine with a few people uh, here, we then gathered uh, elsewhere, still in California, with my family last week to celebrate my dad's 70th birthday. Uh, and Caitlin, me, my brothers traveled from all across the country to celebrate. Uh, and, and, and gather and, and, and honor him for that day. When I mention that, and you know, oh, we celebrated my dad's birthday, most people smile and nod and understanding. Oh, wonderful, how was it? But it is interesting to consider our observance of birthdays and birthday parties. Uh, if we weren't so used to them, we'd probably be pretty confused by them right? Why do we do this? What, is it, what does it mean? This thought came to my mind as I was reading a, a little book by N.T. Wright in preparation for this morning, that he begins in the most creative way. And, and I just want to read it to you. It, it reads just like a little story time, and it's, it's a way that he uh, introduces some ideas that we'll be talking about today. So sit back and listen uh, to, to this story that I read earlier this week. You are just sitting down to the table. It is your 10-year-old sister's birthday party. If you're too old to have a 10-year-old sister, think of your daughter, your niece, or your granddaughter. Okay? Everything is ready. The table is laid. The birthday cake is waiting to have its candles lit. There are balloons everywhere. People have come with odd-shaped parcels. Everyone has arrived. But suddenly, the doorbell rings. You rush to see who it is, and there, just arrived from his own planet, is a polite and fortunately English-speaking Martian. He asks graciously if he can come in. This is going to be a birthday party with a difference. You bring him into the house and to the room where the party is about to start. And after the shock and surprise, people realize he's harmless and just wants to enjoy the fun. And so the party gets underway. But the Martian feels like he knows you best since you met him at the door. Keeps asking you in a low voice, what's going on? Why are all these people here? Why do they pull those things that make that bang? Why are they wearing funny hats? Why does the little girl in the middle of it all keep opening parcels? And why, oh why, is someone trying to set fire to that cake? Every time you try to answer him, it seems to make him more puzzled. Well, it's her birthday. You mean she's just been born? Well, no, she was born 10 years ago. So what's so special about that? Well, we always do this every year. What's a year? It's when, well, you know, 365 days... It isn't with us, but never mind. Why are they giving her things? Because it's her birthday. Why do you give people things on their birthday? Because we always do. I guess I suppose, I guess it's to tell them we think they're special. Well, isn't everyone special? Well, yes, but on your birthday, you're extra special. So why are you all wearing these funny hats? Are they special too? 
Well, yes, in a different way, they're to make the day different. And why are they setting fire to the cake? Well, they aren't. No, those are candles on the cake. Well, why are you lighting the candles? Well, it's, it's quite light in this room. I can see perfectly well. What are you doing? We always do that. I guess it's just because it makes the party special. But why do you put them on the cake? I don't know. We just always do. Everybody does. We don't, says the Martian, but never mind. Why do you all eat things to celebrate someone's birthday? Well, there you got me. I don't know. But who cares? Here, have some cake. On, the com on and on the conversation goes. N.T. Wright continues. Imagine life without parties. Imagine life without the thousand things we do, large and small, that give shape to who we are, that give extra meaning and value to people, to occasions, to the way that we do things. I guess you can just about imagine living without any outward signs as to what you were thinking, no hugs and kisses at the start and end of the day, no wave of the hand, no handshakes, no raising of a glass to toast a bride or a colleague or an exam passed. I suppose we might, if we tried very hard, be able to organize our lives without special meals on special occasions, without special trips to special places, without all those things that bring color and depth to our world. We might just manage it, but life would be very dull. All human societies, in fact, have developed ways of saying things by doing things, or if you like, meaning things by doing things. A military salute, a pat on the head, the handshake that clinches a business deal, all these are symbolic actions that say things, that mean what they mean within a particular world. And some of the most meaningful things are the special meals that people share together, a wedding reception, the supper when the teenager comes home after six months on the other side of the world. The surprise party to celebrate the end of exams. And of course, the birthday party. The birthday party says two things in particular. Jane, the little girl, we wish you a very happy birthday today. And we're glad that ten years ago today you made your grand appearance in the world. The party joins together the past event and this present moment. When my children were little, he comments, we used to tell a suitably abbreviated version of the story of the day they were born as part of the party entertainment. It also looks into the future. Many happy returns, we might say, and many more we might sing, even to a 92-year-old. Somehow, past present and future are held together in this one meal. That's why we make it special, with things that are both silly and meaningless at one level, party hats, candles, and so on, and very special and meaningful at another level. They show that this isn't just an ordinary meal, and that while we're enjoying it, we aren't just ordinary people either. So birthday parties might be puzzling, especially to a Martian that shows up, but they're deeply meaningful, aren't they? Within the community of Christ, we also have some similarly puzzling yet meaningful practices of baptism and communion. More than just a Martian might wonder, what's going on? Why are they dunking people? Why are they eating and drinking that bread and that cup? Right? We can imagine the conversation with these as well. So throughout the year, we've been reflecting on being formed in the image of Jesus, whose life was marked by incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection. As we are formed in his image, our lives have been marked in the same way. As we live with 
presence, service, and hope. Each step along the way, we've paused this year to consider how our practices of baptism and communion help to form us in the image of Jesus. We've seen earlier this year that they are incarnational, dealing with the physical material of water, bread, and wine or juice. We've seen how they are cruciform as they point us to Jesus' death and burial. We're buried in the waters of baptism. We remember his death in the body and the blood. And so today... I want to reflect on how these practices, baptism and communion, are also resurrection practices that form us in the shape of Jesus' resurrection. They point us toward our ultimate hope. And we can see this most clearly whenever we consider the larger story that baptism and communion are part of, which is exactly what Paul does in the passage that we're reading today. So let's read from 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse 1. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. For special days, whether they be birthdays or Mother's Day or other special occurrences. And thank you for special practices like baptism and communion that draw us into your life, death, and resurrection. I pray that as we consider the words of your scripture together this morning, that you would sharpen our minds and soften our hearts, that we might know you and love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10 kicks off about five chapters of instructions around the community's worship gatherings. Paul writes about the Lord's Supper and prayer. He writes about spiritual gifts and the centrality of love. But he begins this whole section by telling people the larger story that they are a part of. The story of God rescuing and redeeming his people so that through them he might rescue and redeem the world. So Paul points back to the foundational story of Israel, the story of Exodus. Verse 1, Paul begins by recalling that story. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they passed through the sea. This story that Paul recalls begins in Exodus chapter 1 with God's people in Egypt enslaved under hard labor. And when they cry out to God for deliverance, he hears them and answers by calling Moses to lead them out of slavery and into freedom. Through Moses, God goes to war against the various Egyptian gods with ten signs that we often call plagues. Through Moses, God faces off with Pharaoh, instructing his people to be set free. And finally, they were released. And so they headed out of Egypt in a great procession, guided by the cloud of God's presence, which led them right up to, and then miraculously through, the Red Sea. 
This Moses story of liberation from slavery is the story that Israel belonged to. So in verse 2, Paul says they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, the story of God's rescue and redemption that began with Moses is brought to its fullness in Christ. The nation of Israel was baptized into Moses as they passed through the sea, but now all people are invited to be baptized into Jesus. In Romans 6, Paul uses this very same Exodus language to tell our story. Romans 6, beginning in verse 3, don't you all know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of God the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with so that we should no longer be slaves to sin. There's that Exodus language. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In this passage, Paul uses the very same language of baptism and freedom from slavery to describe what has happened with us in Christ. But you can see how in Jesus, the story has gotten much bigger. Through Moses, Israel was set free from Egypt. But through Jesus, we are set free from sin and death. Baptism may seem strange to Martians and more, but as we enter the water, we join with all of God's people who have passed through the waters from slavery into freedom. As we enter the waters, we are joined with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. Death and burial as we are buried in the water, and resurrection as we come up. We die to sin as we plunge down, and we are alive in Christ as we are raised up. Baptism is our own exodus story. Baptism is our own resurrection story. But just like Israel in the original Exodus story, our journey is not complete when we pass through the waters. That is just the start. Coming out on the other end of the Red Sea was only the beginning of their long journey through the wilderness. And as the saying goes, though they had been taken out of Egypt, they still needed Egypt to be taken out of them right? Over and over again in the story of Israel, the people complain about their journey through the wilderness. They're hungry and thirsty, and they look back with fondness on their slavery. Because though they'd been promised a land flowing with milk and honey, they were stuck in a barren wilderness. But the story doesn't end there. Paul continues in verses 3 and 4 of our passage. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. This is from the time of the people uh, in the wilderness. 
As they journeyed, they became hungry, so God provided for them. In Exodus 16, God says to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And then it describes how every morning when the people woke up, they would find this bread-like substance scattered around for them to gather up and eat. It was bread-like, but it wasn't exactly bread. So when they, they saw it, they asked, just like the Martian at the birthday party, what is this? What is it? And it turns out the Hebrew word for that question, what is it, is manna. And so what do they call it? What is it? It's manna. What is it? So their wilderness journey, God, in their wilderness journey, God provides for them. And they find this mysterious manna and they receive it. Every day, God provided manna for them. But it was only enough for that day. If they gathered up more than that, it went bad. It was just enough for that day. So their wilderness journey required trust. Ongoing trust. They had to trust that God would provide what they needed every day. This is what Jesus teaches us to do in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Our trust in God is not a one-time act. It's not a one-time decision. It's an ongoing, daily reality. Every day, we must wake up and reaffirm our trust in God. Because though we in Christ have been taken out of sin, we must continually acknowledge the ways in which we still need sin to be taken out of us. This is why God has not only given us the singular moment of baptism passing through the water, but also the ongoing practice of communion to receive from him every time we take it. In Exodus 16, God gives them the food of manna. And then in the next chapter, Exodus 17, God gives them water. God instructed Moses to strike a rock with his staff, and then water flowed out of this rock, allowing people to drink in the middle of a barren wilderness. As Paul reflects on this in 1 Corinthians, he claims at the end of verse 4, that rock was Christ. That rock from which they drank is a picture of what Jesus is like for us, his people. Jesus is our daily bread, and Jesus is our thirst-quenching drink as he offers us his body and his blood. And just like baptism, communion may be a bit puzzling. But hear this, every time we eat the bread and drink the cup, we join with God's people who are journeying through a wilderness toward a promised land. And just like baptism joins us with Jesus in resurrection, so does communion. One chapter later, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, in communion, we often have focused on remembering and proclaiming Jesus' death, which we should. But it's also important to emphasize that we proclaim his death until he comes, right? Until he comes. This communion meal is not only a look back at the cross, but also a look forward to Jesus' return, which is the day that his resurrection becomes our resurrection. On that day, Paul writes again, just a few chapters later in 1 Corinthians 15, the trumpet will sound and the dead will arise. In the book of Revelation, 
That day is depicted as all of God's people gathered around singing and shouting hallelujah as heaven and earth are made new and dressed like a bride and all gather to feast at a great wedding banquet. This is the feast that we anticipate and look forward to every week when we receive the bread and drink the cup. Once more, we can see how in Jesus the story becomes so much bigger. As Israel passed through the waters, they were delivered from Egypt. As we pass through the waters, we're delivered from sin and death. Israel received manna and water in anticipation of a promised land. But we receive bread and the cup in anticipation of a whole new heavens and earth. In Jesus, things become so much bigger. Truly, in Jesus' own words, he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them, to make them all they were meant to be from the very beginning. And fulfill them, he has. He is, as we've already read this morning, the firstborn over all creation and the firstborn from the dead. In his life, death, and resurrection, he's reconciling and redeeming all things in heaven and on earth. And we are joined with him in this resurrection renewal through the practices of baptism and communion. Now, we started off with a funny sci-fi story about a curious Martian from N.T. Wright. Perhaps we can close with another sci-fi metaphor. Several weeks ago, we began reflecting on this whole theme of resurrection, being formed in the image of Jesus' resurrection. And we considered how resurrection is not merely a future event, but also a present reality. In Ephesians, Paul writes that we have been raised with Christ and seated with him. There's a sense in which we are already alive, already resurrected with Jesus. In Christ, we have become members of the age to come, already. We've become a people of the future. You might remember that week when we talked about it, we illustrated this whole idea with the movie Back to the Future, where Marty McFly is this time-traveling person from the future who's interacting with the past. So here's, here's my metaphor. Every time traveler has a time machine, right? And back to the future, it was the DeLorean. Get it up to the right speed, and poof, you're at a different point in time. The sci-fi metaphor I want to leave you with might make you chuckle or roll your eyes a little, is that as a people of the future, our time machine is baptism and communion. These are the things that transport us in time, even for a moment. These are the practices by which we glimpse the future and are connected to the past. The passage we read began with Paul reminding us of our ancient ancestors, the Israelites who passed through the water and received spiritual food and drink. We too, in Christ, have passed through the water and received the spiritual food and drink of his body and blood. Just like ancient Israel, we have been delivered from slavery. Just like ancient Israel, we are anticipating God's promise as we journey through the wilderness. In these practices of baptism and communion, we travel back in time to see their story in our story. But also, 
Every week, when we receive the bread and the cup, we also briefly travel forward in time to catch a glimpse of the coming kingdom, to see, even for a moment, the new heavens and the new earth, so that we might be reminded that we are a resurrection people. We are people of the future, living now, We are people of the promise living in the wilderness. We are people of the kingdom, even as it is coming on earth, just as it is in heaven. And so as we remember our baptism and receive communion, may we be formed in the image of resurrection. Amen. Let's stand. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Here is where we receive the body and the blood of our Savior. Here is where we taste the life that shows us how to lay down our lives. Here is where we drink the cup that sustains us as we offer our lives for him who gave up his life for us. It seems so simple. This practice this discipline of coming every Sunday to receive that which has been given, his spirit stirring our spirit with which he graced us. It is to be received where two or more are gathered together, just like the Trinity is not one, but three, so we are many. Not just I receive, but we receive this holy meal. It shapes our service. It shapes our faith. Do not let it become something less because all was given that you may receive the resurrection promises of the Christ, the head of the church. It was given to remind us of all that we can be for him, our head, our savior, our sacrifice, our king. Let's pray for the bread. Father Almighty, in your wisdom you sent your Son to gather us together 
and join our spirits with his. One way you do this is through this Holy Eucharist. We hold the bread, the body of Jesus, in our hands. As we eat, may we be blessed to receive the goodness that is the Trinity. May we know you reside among us. Hallelujah. Come, let us adore him, Christ our Lord. Amen. The body of Christ. This meal helps us to desire to lose ourselves, just as Christ lost himself. This meal shows the result of a holy, cruciform life, one offered to God without blemish. Partaking in this meal should make us ache in longing for its benefits, uniting us as a body together so that we may discern his good, pleasing, and perfect will and join with him for the sake of the world, his world, to beg him to fill us until we too become a cruciform church. This meal provides a sacred expression of our devotion and love and obedience to his will. Let's pray for the cup. Father Almighty, Your understanding is too far from us. We struggle to lose ourselves for your sake. Forgive us. Allow us still, as we drink the blood of our Savior, to partake in his death, to rely on this beautiful meal, to show us again and again the beauty of your grace, even in death. May you unite us as a church, bowing before you, longing for you as the deer pants for the water. May this blood quench our thirst as we cry hallelujah. Come, let us adore him, Christ our Lord. Amen. The blood of Christ. take a few moments to share with you uh, some uh, items from the life of the church. We always begin with our offering, and we typically don't say too much about it, but it's a, it's an open invitation. It's a, it's a a pledge of our hearts, our love, our faith. Uh, It's an offering, if you want to think of it as, as our, like the little boy in the gospel, the five loaves and the two fishes, of offering to God uh, with the anticipation that God will do kingdom work with it. It's also a pledge of our commitment to one another, to do life together. We're in this together, and we need one another. And so our, our offering uh, is for one another as well. Uh, those are the ways that, that you can... Uh, Give your offering either online or text message or uh, cash uh, in the basket at the back. Uh, So give with open and generous hearts as uh, uh, you wish. Let's pray for that. Father, you are the creator and the giver of all things. And you bless us so that we may be a blessing to others. So give us generous hearts. Make us cheerful givers. Uh, Receive our love and care for you and for one another as a, a part of the dawning of your kingdom among us. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
we also have the uh, Genesis Project as an opportunity uh, to be involved in our community and the lives of, of women who are trying to come out of uh, uh, trafficking and, and just being uh, in, in really pretty horrible situations. Uh, our monthly meal is coming up. I think there are still some tags. If you look on the bulletin board uh, out in the foyer, there are still some tags, some items that we need for that. If you will be sure and, and check that. Uh, and, and bring that to you. Is that next week, Drew? Do you know? So it, if you'll bring your items next Sunday, then those will be delivered as well. Um, also in the foyer there, we're kind of at the very beginning of gardening season, so you'll see some uh, tomato starts there. You can feel free to help yourself to those. They'll uh, probably not good for pots unless you have a really big pot, uh, but uh, if you would like to have a, a tomato start in your own garden, uh, feel free there. There's also some bok choy in the back if you'd like to try uh, that. So there are some plastic bags. Help yourself uh, if you so desire. Um, was yes, for those of you that were here yesterday, was that a great day? It, it really was. We um, Drew led us through the uh, the the Enneagram it, it, it titled uh, it, "To Find Yourself, Lose Yourself," uh, or "To Lose Yourself, To Find Yourself." How are you? I've got that dyslexia thing going on. A Christ-centered Enneagram retreat. He led us through it, uh, and and you know when you when you go through those those kinds of of situations, it's it's good news and uh, maybe not so good news sometimes. But in in this life of uh, spiritual growth, it's really good to kind of peel back the actions and the responses that we have and see underneath what some of the motives are. Why, why am I the way I am? Uh, both for, for in good ways and sometimes broken ways, right? And, and so that's what Drew led us through yesterday. And I tell you, it was really encouraging uh, to, to sit in a room full of people and, and realize that, hey, we all have some issues, right? We're not in this alone. We're together. And, and so it, it was a pretty rich day. Um, Drew, thank you for leading us through that. So some of you have talked, have, have wondered about maybe being a follow-up. And so if you would uh, kind of let Drew know, we'll, we'll see if uh, there's a place in the calendar. Maybe in the future we can, we can follow up with another session of that and continue it. Uh, it's... Uh, it, it'll be it'll be good if and if you missed it yesterday that'll be your opportunity to get on board uh, along those lines uh, we we don't say it uh, but per perhaps we should um, Drew's really a gift to us and and so let's let's acknowledge that as well uh, for a for a time for a place uh, the gifts that he has brought and brings to us on a continual basis. Uh, that's pretty rich. And let's, let's just, uh, let's thank him, let's thank God, uh, but let's be aware that this is, this is a special situation. So, thank you, Drew. And with that, before I get all maudlin, let's stand and sing our last song. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things we will say together. We will feast and weep no more. We will not be burned.
the dark of night before the dawn. My soul be not afraid for the promised morning, oh how long. O oh, God of Jacob, be my strength, we will feast in the house of Zion, we will sing with our hearts restored. Great things we will say together. We will feast and weep no more. Every vow we broken and betrayed. You are the faithful one, and from the garden to the grave, bind us together. Bring shalom. We. Thank you. 